Well, good morning. My name is Jesse. It's fun to see some old familiar faces this morning. Would you pray with me and we'll get started. Father in heaven, thank you for a beautiful day in which we get to draw breath, in which we get to breathe in your grace. Even if we're not aware of it, um, you provide it, Father. And I pray that you would um, focus our hearts to hear what Matthew 8 has to say to us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I was raised in a home that taught the biblical realities of the presence of God, the existence of God, uh, of God giving angels watch and care over us, but also the existence of a personal Satan and the existence of demons. It's something that I believed in and believe in now. I wasn't a Christian, though. Uh, I came to know the Lord a couple weeks after I graduated high school. Well, during my senior year, before I graduated, before I became a Christian, I went to go see a horror movie. And I went with a friend. And essentially, the movie was about a family that got attacked by some evil force of the spiritual nature. And one scene in particular, which was like the scariest scene of the film, and my friend decided to go up and get a refill for their drink, which I thought was just a dirty trick. It terrified me so much to see some evil spiritual force. And I was a senior in high school, I was like 18. That, I mean, but I was just absolutely mortified. And I couldn't close my eyes during this scene. And my eyes just started watering. And for the next week, I had night terrors. I had cold sweats. I couldn't look into my closet at night. If I parked in our driveway and it was dark, I felt like I had to run to the backyard, or to run to my back door. And essentially what it did is it awoke in me this awareness that if anything of an evil spiritual nature came knocking at my door, I was ill-equipped to guard myself from it, to protect myself from it. I had no authority over anything like that. I, you know, I considered myself a tough guy but when it was something unseen, something insidious, that mortified me because I had no comfort from it. It wasn't until that I came to know the Lord after I graduated high school that I had any sort of solace from it. And I don't say that to condemn scary movies. To this day, I don't watch scary movies be simply because they scare me. <laughs> uh, uh, I also don't really watch a ton of war movies because they upset me in a way that I don't like, so I'm kind of an all-around softie these days. Um, but for me, seeing a vivid display of that was, in a sense, it didn't make me a Christian, but it made me fear a real Satan and a real demon, um, because I believed in it. I believe in it now. G.K. Chesterton is an author. He was once questioned on why write children's fiction and fairy tales that give children the fear of the boogeyman. His response was this. Fairy tales are not responsible for producing in children fear or any of the shapes of fear. Fairy tales do not give the child the idea of the evil or the ugly. That is in the child already because it is in the world already. Exactly what the fairy tale does is this. It accustoms him for a series of clear pictures to the idea that these limitless terrors have a limit, that these shapeless enemies have enemies in the nights of God and that there is something in the universe more mystical than darkness and stronger than strong fear. Enter the supreme authority of the God-man Jesus over the demonic realm in Matthew chapter 8. So there's three things I want to see primarily as a broad view of our text today. And those three things are the presence of demons and the response to Jesus. Second is the presence of Jesus and his response to demons. Third, the response of humans to both of the above. Now, to do a quick overview of where we're at in Matthew, we just go a little bit at a time through the book of Matthew for the last couple of months now. We're in chapter 8, obviously. And one thread that you could take a focus of what is Matthew about, it's a genealogy of who Jesus is and his unique sonship. Matthew 1, verse 1, this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Okay, who is he the, the, the unique son of? He's the son of David, the offspring of Abraham. He's the Messiah. He's king. He's the suffering servant from Isaiah. 
He's a greater Israel. He's testified as God's anointed Messiah by John the Baptist. The voice of God breaks the silence of 300 years and says, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. The Spirit of God dwells on him. Satan testifies to who he is in chapter 4 when he says, If you are the Son of God, command these, command these stones. And you see, God's, you see Jesus' unique sonship start to have this broader and broader meaning for everyone else to see. Then in Matthew 5 through 7, you have the Sermon on the Mount. And he, Jesus speaks authoritatively on the matters of God. And they ask at the end of chapter 7, who is this who speaks with authority? Not like our scribes do. Then, not only does he speak with authority about the matters of God, but he speaks with authority over reality itself. So in chapter 8, we have five to six instances of Jesus having authority with just a word or just a hand placed over leprosy, paralysis, fevers, demonic possessions, over nature itself. There's a violent storm, and Jesus rebukes the wind and the sea, and they obey him. So he doesn't just teach with authority, he speaks with authority, and reality conforms itself to what he says. So this is where we're at. Now, the nature of our encounter today, which is 28 through 34, is not dissimilar to the previous one of the raging the storm because they are both violent settings. They're uncontrollable, untamable. Look at verse 28 for me. And when he came to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, to the country of the Gadarenes, you might have Gerasenes, this is Gentile territory, two demon-possessed men met him coming out of the tombs, so fierce that no one could pass that way. They're, these two men who are possessed, and, and Mark and Luke have an account of this, this same instance in their Gospels. And they give us a number of, this is a couple of thousand demons possessing these two men. And they name them, the demons name themselves and they say, I am legion, for I am many. And no one can control these people. Just like the storm and seasoned lifelong fishermen are crying out, Lord, save us. They have no control over the sea, and the people living in this area in Gentile territory have no control over the demonic realm. Now, just up front as a disclaimer, demons are a heavy topic. C.S. Lewis wrote this in his introduction to the Screw Tape Letters. There are two equal and opposite errors into which the human race can fall about devils. One is to, dis to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. So I don't want to give an excessive focus on demons, but I also don't want to overlook the simple fact that Satan is real, that demons are real, that they're not abstract ideas of evil. But rather they are spiritual beings who are intrinsically evil and seek only to harm and to deceive. Jesus says this about the devil in, in John 8. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a, a liar and the father of lies. This is the essence of demons of Satan who Jesus is encountering. Now, we live in Western culture. In Western culture, we don't see necessarily overt demon possessions like this commonly. It's uncommon to us. We're very materialistic, so as a culture, you know, 30,000 foot view, what we can see, taste, and touch is what we believe in, that which is material. And because of that, we're, there's a, an element of spiritual numbness. Now, this doesn't mean the activity of demons is any less. I would actually argue that it is as prevalent in Denton as it is in places like Haiti, where witchcraft is a popular religion, or in places like Africa and Asia, where animism and mysticism and, and ancestral worship is still practiced. I say that because, one, the Bible tells us that all activities of the devil and his demons are deceitful in nature. Genesis says the serpent was more cunning and more crafty than any creature in the garden. Meaning, we may not even be aware that there is spiritual warfare occurring in our 
daily lives. Secondly, Scripture informs us that the confusion of human identity, an unwillingness to forgive, living in unholy passions and wrath, lying, doing violence to one another, false teachings about the person of Jesus, greed, the love of power, a blindness toward the gospel, are all biblical symptoms, among others, that demonic activity is at work. Now, do you see any of those in our culture, in our town? Just drive down 35 for 10 minutes, and you've got half that list covered. Those are all biblical symptoms of demonic activity and spiritual warfare. C.S. Lewis again wrote in his screw tape letters, and the screw tape letters, it's, a, it's this book, it was kind of an opposite book, where it's a perspective of a senior demon writing letters to his nephew, who was a, an, a novice demon, on how to keep somebody from being a Christian and then how to make a Christian fall. And he says this in the letter, Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. That is more the story of the West, Satan's slow working, not overt displays of his presence like we see here in Matthew 8. However, though generally speaking, the West is not a spiritually active place, vague spiritualism, which gives rise more to demonic activity, is becoming more present, even in Denton. So within Denton, there's an organization called the Covenant of Unitarian Universalist Pagans. They practice spells, witchcraft, incantations, they worship ancestors, make sacrifices, and worship the earth. And they've got their own building, their own property, and they gather and they do this. There's a store just a little bit south of the square called Bewitched, operated by a self-reclaimed witch and diviner who offers a wide array of readers, psychics, and mediums for hire. And here's the, here's the bio description of one of her readers. Satnam, it's nice to pre-meet you. I am a divine spiritual being that lives and plays in the world of magic, dancing between worlds, lifting the veil, and encouraging you to join me. I surround myself as a conduit to my benevolent team of divine beings of love and light to gift you with the guidance you've been seeking. I look forward to connecting with you. That is not of God. That is demonic. So whether it's the love of power and pride and small deceit, or it's I'm a divine being and I love to play in the world of magic, demonic activity is as prevalent here as it is in other places of the world that have different contexts. So, because of that, the next four verses are of critical importance to us. So let's look at the response of these two demon-possessed men to the presence of Jesus in the area that they dominate. Remember, at the end of verse 28, it says, no one can pass that way. This is their turf. This is the place that they rule. Let's read 29 through 31. And behold, they cried out, what have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a herd of many pigs was feeding at some distance from them, and the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, send us away into the herd of pigs. Now, demons arguably more than humans believe and tremble at the knowledge of who God is. The book of James says, You say that God is one, you do well. Do not even the demons believe and tremble? They know who God is. Now, the, the response of these demons gives us a lot of information as to the authority that Jesus wields. Through the demons' own words, the spiritual powers of evil, demons, will one day be judged, and the Son of God will be the one to carry that out. Verse 29, are you here to torment us? before the time. There is coming a time where Jesus will destroy his enemies and eradicate evil. That is an element of the gospel. If you don't have that, then you don't have gospel. If you don't have the eradication of evil by a righteous king, by a righteous judge, then you don't have gospel. And the demons know exactly who Jesus is. 
Now, here's a look at Jesus when he returns to make righteous war on all his enemies from Revelation 19. Then I saw heaven open. This is, this is going to be about Jesus. And behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. He has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and by the name which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, these demons who call themselves Legion and Mark and Luke know exactly who they're talking to. Whenever they say Son of God, they're understanding the implications of who they're speaking with. So they're by no means arguing with him. What have you to do with us? They're pleading. Why are you here? They know that hell is a place reserved for them and for those who reject God. It is not a place that they rule. I'll say that again. They know that hell is a place reserved for them, for those who reject God, and it is not a place that they rule. And they also know that Jesus possesses the authority to distribute that justice against them. And isn't it ironic that the ones who are tormenting these two men and tormenting the region that they live in are in a way asking for Jesus, don't torment us. It's ironic. It's like the white witch in Narnia. She has her reign of terror. She turns people to stone. It's endless winter. But with the coming of Aslan, her reign is doomed. And summer comes. Well, let's see what the presence of Jesus does and what his response is to the demons. Verse 32. And he said to them, Go. So they came out and went into the pigs. And behold... The whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. At a simple authoritative word, what was uncontrollable, what was untamable, just like a storm on the sea, Jesus calms. As John spoke last week, Jesus is Emmanuel, which means God with us. And it's not just a title, it's actually God with us. Jesus is God, which means he wields the authority that God wields. And it's interesting that if you have a manual at the beginning of Matthew, it says God is with us. At the very end of Matthew, when Jesus gives the Great Commission, and he says, and behold, I am with you, even until the end of the age. He is with us. Well, by being the God-man, he has the same authority. And what authority does God speak with? Well, in Genesis, God said, let there be light, and there was light. After that, six times God says something about creation, and six times creation obeys. Because creation could do no other than to obey the authoritative word of God. It had no other option. So when Jesus says, go. What's the following couple of words? So they came out. They had no other option. Jesus is the word of the Father, which the Gospel of John tells us. He, in the beginning, was the word, and the word was, was with God, and the word was God. Hebrews tells us that Jesus is the exact imprint of God's nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Colossians 1, he is before all things in priority, and in him all things hold together. Where at the word of Jesus, the universe stays together because he simply says, remain. He says to the sun, rise. He says to the rain, fall, and it does. This is what Jesus wields, and the demons are well aware. Now, I have two sons. One is three, and one is, the other one is one. And 
I made up a game in the car for when we're stuck at stoplights because a three-year-old and one-year-old if they're bored at a stoplight is not the best thing in the world. <laughs> so I made up a game and it's called Go Green. So what we try and do is we count one, two, three, and we say, go green. And we try and time it just right to where they feel like they turned the light green just with their word. <laughs> and they always try and jump the gun. You know, it'll turn yellow or red, and they're like, go green. And I'm like, rookies. <laughs> so I'll watch the yellow light on the other side. And then when it's, you know, it hits yellow, and I'll say, okay, ready? One two, three, and then all of us say, go green. And then it'll, we try and hit it, and sometimes we hit it right on the nose. And they go, <gasps> <laughs> and they just, they're so excited because they just controlled the light turning from red to green. And you might say, well, you're deceiving your kids, and to that, I really don't have an answer. <laughs> but the feeling that they have of, I have a word of authority, over reality is just perception. It's not reality. But when Jesus speaks, it's actual. The power that he speaks with is actual. Go. And that's all you get. So they came out. In the other instances in chapter 8, Jesus says, with a word, and the sickness leaves, the demon leaves, or he stretches out his hands. So the Roman centurion says, I'll come and heal him. He displays great faith. And from a distance, the Roman centurion servant is healed. This is who Jesus is. Now, the second half of verse 32. Let's read that again. So they came out and went into the pigs, and behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. Now, this is talking about the pigs drowning, not the demons. And we see here again proof that the devil and his demons seek only to destroy and to harm. And they just kill the pigs. In Job, God says, you wanted to destroy my servant Job without reason, without cause. In Mark 9, a boy is afflicted by a demon since his childhood. And it says, it often tried to destroy him by casting him into the fire, into water. We already looked at John 8 when it says Satan was a murderer from the beginning. He's the father of lies. And even Satan's deception of Eve in the Garden of Eden could be considered murder because he knew God's word. The day that you eat of this fruit, you shall surely die. And he deceives her anyways, knowing the consequence. Now, in light of the authority of Jesus, in light of his powerful word, Let's see what the human response will be. Now, in 33 and 34, let's read that. The herdsmen fled, and going into the city, they told everything, especially what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. Now, you would imagine, woohoo, we get our area back. No one can pass by this region. It's tormented by tormented men. You think there'd be a big party, right? There's someone there who spoke with a word and cast out these spiritual beings of evil. Right? But no, they respond in a similar way to the demons. They beg and plead with Jesus to leave their area. And the disciples are seeing an early lesson of what Jesus will later say in chapter 10. If a town does not receive you or listen to your words, shake the dust from your feet as you leave. We're going to see as we go through the Gospels, as we go through Matthew, that not everybody wants Jesus. And you think... He just liberated your whole area. And they don't want him. He interfered with their pig business. He upset their local economy for a little bit. And in fact, not only will some people not want him in their area, 
They'll put him on a cross. The weighty side of the gospel is this, that human beings are able to close their hearts to God. In chapter 8, we saw leprosy, paralysis, sicknesses, violent storms, and demons all obey the authoritative word of Jesus. Yet, the primary thing that we see reject and not want Jesus' presence is the human heart. Isn't that crazy? That it's more miraculous for a human heart to repent than it is for someone to walk again who was lame. And this is us today. We fear that God's presence, His power, and His authority in our lives would disrupt, would inconvenience our tiny little worlds. Their pig farming industry was ruined for the time being. Even though they just witnessed someone liberate their area of what had terrorized them. And we're too prone to fall in love with the character of this world rather than the character of the next one that Jesus offers, that he ushers in. Now, the narrative in this text is dealing primarily in a Gentile context. It's in the land of the Gerasenes. They're among the tombs. They're pig farmers. They're demon-possessed men. All of these things to a Jewish reader and a Jewish audience would just scream out unclean, ceremonial unclean, unfit to be around. And it can, this text can almost feel excessively negative to the Gentile world whenever Jesus enters it. Because the setting and the response, demon-possessed men living in tombs, pig farmers, they reject Jesus, and then he leaves. So is he in, disinterested in Gentiles? And Gentiles is just meaning non-Jews. And the first thing to note is, one, Jesus is traveling in a region of Gentiles, which most Jews wouldn't have ventured to do to begin with. Second, who does Jesus say to go and make disciples of at the end of this book? All nations. Third, Jesus simply authoritatively grants the request of both instances of pleading and begging from our passage. The first one, the demons beg or plead to be cast in the pigs, and he permits their, he permits their request and casts them out. The second one, the people come, are fearful of him, angry from their loss of the herd, and they beg and they plead him to leave their area. Jesus wasn't cold, cold-hearted. He just answered what was asked of him. He permitted what was requested. And then fourth, within this same chapter, who was it said about by Jesus, I have seen, uh, I found no one in Israel with such great faith? A Roman centurion, a Gentile. So it's not that Jesus is disinterested in Gentiles, but he gave literally the people what they wanted in this area. Whereas in the Roman soldier, earlier in chapter 8, Gave him what he wanted as his display of faith. So we see faith in Jesus is for anyone, anywhere, and any time. Jesus was as accessible to the people in the garrisons after he cast out all these demons as he was to the Roman soldier. And you have two exact opposite reactions. The Roman soldier says, I don't even come into my house because I'm not worthy of you to step into my house. The other group says, you messed up my business, get out. And that's the human heart, we're fickle. We have our eyes on such low things. Now, we did see from our text that there were two instances of Jesus being begged or pleaded with. And I'd like to read to you the third instance of him being pleaded with from Mark's account of this same event. So in Mark chapter five, 17 through 20, it says this. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. We already saw those people. Now, as he, Jesus, was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons, one of them, begged him that he might go with him. Here's our, our third begging. One of the demon-possessed men comes to Jesus as getting in the boat, and he begs him to go with him. And Jesus did not permit him, which is interesting. But he said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you 
and how he has shown mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone had marveled. Now, Jesus' authority actually changes the order of things. He's not like a sports car that can rev its engine and spin its tires. He doesn't cast a bunch of demons out and then go, like, look what I did. He actually changed a life. There was a man who was being tormented day and night by the presence of demons. And Jesus liberated him. So that man comes to him afterward and says, please let me go with you. And Jesus turns him into an evangelist. And he says, no. And this is the one request he doesn't grant. No, go back to your cities, to the Decapolis, the Gentile region, and tell them what's been done for you. And then everyone marvels. To see this man, Mark and Luke says that they were chained in his right mind, saying what Jesus had done for them. Jesus invades and reorients our skewed realities, and he brings them back into alignment. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said, we must be willing to allow ourselves to be interrupted by God. In little moments in our life, if he interrupts us, are we willing to be interrupted? So if you haven't trusted Jesus, if you haven't come to that point, if he's not your authority, if he hasn't spoken, go. Would you let your proverbial pigs run into the sea and might you follow Jesus? Maybe there is economic ruin in your life. Maybe there is health ruin in your life. Maybe there's a loss of a loved one. Allow yourself to be interrupted by God. He's invading your reality. Our skewed little worlds. And he's bringing you into alignment with the world to come. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. If you have trusted him, the demonic realm is defeated for you by Jesus' death and his resurrection. It's done. And Romans 16, 20 applies to you, which says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So in summary, we see five things from our text. Jesus has absolute authority over Satan and his demons. Second, he will one day, eternally and with finality, judge them and all evil. Three, he is the liberator of the afflicted. Four, people can reject his liberation. Five, accept the freedom that he offers. Would you pray with me? And we'll do communion. Father in heaven, you have given us the full armor of God. He who dwells in us is greater than he who dwells in the world. Thank you, Father, that this is as much as we'll have to see in this world and in this life, as close as we'll have to get to hell, and that a new world is coming. For those of us who are in Jesus. Father, for those in this room who do not know you, who do not know your son, who do not have your authority over their life, I pray that this might awaken in them the need, the necessity. And I pray that the small things of life, of pig farming, um, of things that can keep our eyes downward. I pray that those would not be inhibitors, that they would not keep us from seeing you, Father, keep us from trusting you, that we would want you in our area, that we would plead to go with you. Would we be your witnesses, Father, of your authority, of your grace, and of your love. In Jesus' name, amen.